If you have your Bible, you're going to want to turn into John chapter 14. John chapter 14, we're going to be looking at verses 21 through 28. John's in the New Testament, one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know, there are some things, and and, and maybe for you too, there are some things that just bother me. They just bug me. You you might even call them pet peeves. Do do any of you, do you kind of go through some, where where there are just certain things that just, you just, oh, you just go to the forehead, you're like, really, come on. And it just, it just bugs the fire out of you. Here, here's a couple for me, just, just so I want to tell you. So when, when I'm in the grocery store and you see someone who goes to the, to the express lane and it's 10 items or less and they've got like 50 items, okay, that, that, I, I don't understand that. That bothers me. I don't know if it's, if it's a, a comprehension issue, but really, I mean, it's, it's, it's 10. And, and, and at some point when they were going to that line, they, just, they probably just said, I don't care. And so they were just going to do that. Th- that bugs me. Another one is uh, parents who, who get in these major arguments at kids' sporting events. Okay, that bugs me. That bothers me. I'm like, really, it's, it's, it's about the kids. There's no money being exchanged here. This is, this is just for the kids. Let's just have a good time. Everybody take a chill pill because after this is over, guess what? Your kids aren't going to think about this game anymore. They're going to be thinking about what's, what's my snack, what, what's coming up next. So it really bugs me. Or people who are, uh, this, this is what I'm sounding like right now because I'm complaining, but people who are always negative, okay? They're just negative about everything. I mean, it, it could be something amazing and they're still going to pick it apart. You know, we could say, well, Jesus was born and he was placed in a manger. Well, you know, that manger probably had, you know, stickers and stuff and it was probably real. I would never put my baby in a manger and blah, blah. You know, it's just that you, whatever it is, they, they, they're just, they're just going to find something to complain about. Or, or when someone, uh, when you're playing a game with someone and there's just this, that one person who's over the top competitive. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's like they've lost their religion when they're playing games and they've got to win. Or, or you're in a group and someone just monopolizes the conversation and there's like 15 other people in the group, but this one person just feels like they have to tell you everything that's on their mind. Or here's the one that really bugged me and that I'm still praying about was when, when Taco Bueno took out Diet Coke and they put in Diet Pepsi. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many tears I shed that day when I walked in. I almost walked out, but I just got my food to go and went home and had a Diet Coke. But, but, but you know what? Here's another thing that bugs me. All seriously, here's, some thing, here's one thing that really bothers me. It's when you hear a preacher or when you see churches that say loving God means that you will be rich, you, you'll have great riches, or your life will always be easy. And here's the deal. They say, and if your life is not that way, then guess what? It must, be, it must be your fault. You're not doing something right. If you don't have great riches, then, well, then, then it's your fault. Or if, if, if your life has problems, then, well, it's something that you're doing. Or if your life isn't easy, though, well, then it's, it's you. And there's a lot of things that God promises us. There's a lot of things that, that he, He's going to bless us with. But, but this whole, you're going to be rich and your life will always be problem-free, that, that ain't one of them. But there are some amazing benefits that we can experience as followers of Jesus. And these benefits are greater than anything that this world can provide. So we're in the middle of this series called Follow. And in this series, we've been talking about it uh, for several weeks about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And that following means obeying. You can't say you're a follower of Jesus and then not follow Jesus. It's pretty simple. Obedience is a standard, not just knowledge. And we, you've heard me say this, and Chad said this, knowledge, knowledge is useless if it's, if, it's not, if it's not applied. So this morning, we're going to look at four benefits, four benefits of being a follower of Jesus. And when we live in obedience, there are some things that God chooses to bless us with, and there are things that He chooses to give to us, and, and, and things that, are, that will benefit us when we choose to follow Him. So let's jump right into this. John 14, verses 21 through 28, and it says this. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, 
My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And here we go. One of the, one of the great obedient four benefits, one of those great benefits is this, and you can follow along your outline, is the assurance of salvation. This is one of the great benefits that comes as with being a follower of Jesus Christ. And so the question comes, well, how do I know, how do I know I'm saved? How do you know you're saved? Well, I'll, I'll answer that question with another question. Do you obey God? Do you obey God? Do you do what, what he asks you to do, to do? You see, the Bible is real clear that one of the distinguishing marks of a follower of Christ is obedience. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a believer in him, then one of the things that's going to be distinctive in your life is that you're going to be obedient to what he says. Matter of fact, the first verse that we read, verse 21, it said this, whoever has my commandments and keep them, keeps them, he it is who loves me. And then again in verse 23, it said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And if you look back, I didn't read it, but if you look back up to verse 15, it says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, before I go any further, let, let me uh, make something very clear. Uh, we do not, hear me say this, I want to repeat this. We do not have to earn God's love. We do not have to earn God's love. He loves us regardless of our love for him. In Romans, we're told that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our salvation, is, it's not based on merit, what we've done or, or what we have to do. Our salvation comes from Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. This is not something that we've earned, nor is it something that we deserved. So I just want to be clear on that, that this, we do not earn God's love. We don't have to work for God's love. We don't have to earn it, but a sign of our love for Him is obedience. You see the difference? Our obedience is a response to God in His love. It's not a requirement. And the Bible is clear. If we truly love God, if we are truly His followers, if we say that we are Christians, that we are believers in Him, then we will obey Him. 1 John 1, 6 says, So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. Did you catch that language there? You're lying if you say you have fellowship. And that word fellowship is not just about sharing a meal together. It's, it's bigger than that. It's talking about this deep connection. It's the Greek word koinonia that you've probably heard before. And if you think about it, it, it makes sense. You can't say you love God you can't say that you're a follower of Christ if you're not following. 1 John 2, 3-6 through 6 says, We know that we have come to know Him. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys His word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. But you might have a, a reaction like I did when you read some of these scriptures. My reaction is, well, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I don't always do the right thing. I don't always follow God. I'm not always obedient. Does that mean that I'm not saved? And if you're like me, then you, you kind of start to panic. But I don't think these verses are talking about perfection. God knows that we are not perfect. Matter of fact, he, he even tells us in James that if we say we're without sin, then we're, we're lying. Okay, God knows that we're not perfect. And we see in Scripture example after example of followers of Jesus who were not perfect. Life is about God continuing to, sh to mold us and shape us. And we all fight the battle between what the Bible calls the flesh and the spirit. It's the constant battle. And it's a struggle for all Christians. It's, it's the reality of all Christ followers. Uh, in, in a book, I recommend this book for you. It's called Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart. It's, it's by a pastor. Uh, his name is J.D. Greer. And he says, the fact there is even a battle in you means the Spirit of God is in you. If it wasn't, you wouldn't even care. Your sin wouldn't bother you. 
Now, for, for a lot of people, you would say, well, the people are bothered when they do things wrong. Well, a lot of times what they're bothered by is they're bothered by the consequences that come with the mistakes that they've made. But for the believer, it's bigger than just consequences of what we've done. For the believer, we understand that when we sin, we know that it, it hurts our relationship with God. It puts distance in our relationship with God. Not created by God, but the distance is created by us. If you love God, then the overarching sentiment in your life is to follow him. It is not, it is not this. Well, I got God's grace, and he promises forgiveness, so I'm good. I can do my own thing. See, that's not love. That's not a follower of Christ. That's selfishness. That's a life that's not surrendered to God. 1 John 2, 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see the difference? Are you chasing after the things of this world? Or are you chasing after God? Here's, here's, here's the idea there. You can't do both. Because if, if, if I'm chasing if I'm chasing you over here, then that means I can't go after you over there. I'm chasing after one. Now, there'll be times, maybe there'll be bumps where I'm chasing after you and, and, and maybe I trip and I fall. There may be some struggles. There may be some times where I get distracted and I look back. But the idea is, is that my life is, I, I'm in pursuit of following Jesus. And I, I'm thankful to God that there is grace for me in those moments where I, I do hit a bump, where I do trip, where I do get distracted. But you can't pursue the world and then pursue Christ at the same time. 1 John 2.17 says, And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Again, it's, it's not about trying to, to do enough good so that you can be loved by God and earn His forgiveness. You can't, you can't earn it. Salvation is a gift. But you can't say that you love God if you completely ignore Him and there are no visible signs of his lordship in your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, guess what? It's going to bear fruit in your life. There, there's going to be things that, that come out of your life because you are a follower, because you are pursuing him. We're gonna, you're going to be able to see those. You're going to be able to notice those. Now, my goal is not to confuse you this morning and to make you walk out of here mad at me or, 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 or sad because you think I'm saying to you you're not a Christian. That's not what I'm doing. But what I do want to ask you is to look at your life and ask yourself, is my life marked by obedience to God or have I just used God's grace and forgiveness as a get out of jail free card so that I can keep living my life the way that I want to live it without any, or without any outside interference? You have to ask yourself that question. But one of, the, one of the benefits of obedience, one of the benefits of pursuing God is that we know that we belong to Him. Here's another one. Another benefit of obedience is intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. If you, if you still have your Bible open to John 14, verse 21 says, And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then later in verse 23, it says, And if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, what we just said, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You see, obedience means that God will show us things. He will reveal things to us and give, her, give us deeper insights through his word. And look at those two, two ways that they describe the, the, the two kind of what we have there for intimacy. And the first one says that, that he will manifest itself. In other words, he's going to show us things. He's going to reveal things to us, things that we didn't see before, things that we didn't know before. God is going to open those doors up for us so that we can see them, so that we can know them. He will manifest through obedience, our obedience. He's going to manifest himself to us. And the other, the other object of intimacy there was says that, that the Father and Jesus and his Father will come and they will make, make their home in us. It's that whole, whole idea of that there's that togetherness. When, when the, we are going to live with God, God will be in us. And our knowledge of him will grow deeper and will grow more intimate. It's just like any other relationship. The more time you spend with someone, the more you learn about them and the more that they start to share with you. Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call to me 
and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. That idea for that verse is, is like a walled city that's not accessible. You can't get into the city because there's this giant wall around it, and it's not accessible unless someone opens up the gate or lowers, lowers the drawbridge or however you want it, but opens up the gate so that then you have access. And so when we are obedient, what happens is, is that God will open up the gates and allow us access into things that, that we did not know. Revelation 3.20 says, Look, I have been standing at the door and I am constantly knocking. If anyone hears me calling him and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. And a lot of people think that that verse, Revelation 3.20, is a, is a salvation verse where, where where God is talking to someone who doesn't know him. But if you, are, if you know anything about Revelation, you realize that these are letters to churches, letters to people who know God, who, who would call themselves followers of Christ. And he says he's standing at the door knocking. And there's that word again. He says, I will come in and have fellowship with him. That's that fellowship. It's, it's a picture of intimacy. And we only hear his knocking when we are what? When we're listening. We only hear his knocking when we're listening. God is, God is not going to come to the door of your heart and kick it in. He's not going to bust open the door, but what he's going to do is he's going to wait for you to open it. He's not going to invite himself in. But when we choose to be obedient, when we choose to listen to him and open the door, then he will come in. John 15, 15 says, I am no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father, manifesting himself, revealing himself to his followers. Jesus isn't talking to a great crowd of a bunch of people who don't know him. Jesus is talking to his followers, to those who call him Lord. Romans 8, 15 through 17 says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. There's intimacy. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You see, the implication of those two passages of Scripture is that we have moved from being on, on, in a position of being on the outside to being brought into, into what I'll call the inner circle. It doesn't mean that, that we're better than other people. It doesn't mean that, that our lives are worth more than others because this invitation is open to all. Jesus Christ, is, his, his invitation is to everyone. Everyone, can be, everyone who chooses can come in and enjoy this intimacy. It doesn't mean that we're better. It just means that our, our obedience has put us in a position where we can experience intimacy with God that we would miss. We would miss if we were busy doing our own thing, not being obedient. I remember um, our, my first mission trip that I took to Guatemala. Um, we, we'd taken a group of our students there when I was still a uh, youth minister here, and we'd taken a group of students and adults there, and, and we were going up to this uh, village up kind of up in, in a mountain. And one of the things that we were going to do there is we were going to show the Jesus film. And we were told that, that um, when we get to there, they were going to have they would have a, a kind of a projection unit and, and, a, and a sound system. But when we got there, there wasn't that. They didn't have, I, I remember we had some kind of sound system. I don't know if it was with us or it happened to be there. But the only thing that we had was I, I had my laptop. And so we were, we were, uh, we were in, this, in this room, uh, in this village, and um, there was about 50 people or so, maybe a little bit more, uh, in this room. And half of them were, were kids and, and, and little kids. So we don't, have, we don't have a projector. We've got somewhat of a sound system. We've got 25 kids running around this, running around this place. And, and so I, everything about that situation said plan B. Okay, what's plan B? Well, me being the planner that I am, I had no plan B. And so we, we're just kind of looking around. And so we said, well, let's just show the movie. So I, I crack open my laptop you know, hooked it up to whatever sound system was there and played it. And guess what? For, I don't remember how long the Jesus movie is. It's not a short film. But for whatever long hour, hour and a half it was, we had people glued to that little bitty screen. And guess what? The kids, the kids sat down. I mean, it was, it was almost like, like 
you know, Moses just put his rod and just whiff, raised it over the people. And everyone went, boom. And they were just there. And, and I remember afterwards, we, we shared after we watched the Jesus, or they watched the Jesus. And there were people that kind of came uh, from, from around the village. And they were looking inside the windows um, you know, to this place and, and kind of peeking in and listening um, to, the, to the video. And then after it was over, I remembered we shared the gospel using the Evangel Cube. And there were several people who, who came to know the Lord that day. And, and here's the deal that, that I always think about that. Our mission team, we would have missed that. We would have missed the blessing of getting to see God work. We would have missed the, the, the intimate moment with him had we just looked at our surroundings and gone, mm, ain't going to work. But because we were, we were obedient, because we, we said yes, and because we said, you know what, God, you can do whatever you want to do, we, people, got, people got to hear the message of the gospel. And people that day declared their, their faith in Jesus Christ. And I don't say that to say, ooh, look what we did. I just say that because if we weren't obedient, guess what? We would have missed that. So I think it's important that we know that when we're obedient to God, one of the benefits is we get intimacy with him. He reveals things to us through his word, and we get to see him at work. And that's awesome, awesome. Third benefit, another benefit there to obedience is the Holy Spirit's presence. The Holy Spirit's presence. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' presence in us. Jesus' followers are promised the Holy Spirit. And in verse 14 there, or in John chapter 14, he's, the Spirit is described as the helper who will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. John 16, 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. One of the roles that the Holy Spirit has in our lives is that the Holy Spirit will lead us to full comprehension of all that God wants us to know. The Holy Spirit doesn't, he doesn't bring a separate message that would differ from God's message. As one commentary puts it, they, the disciples, will be led further into the realization of his person, of Jesus, and into the development of the principles that he's already laid down. So the Spirit, the benefit that we have of obedience is the, the Holy Spirit. That Spirit will never speak contrary to God's Word or God's commands in Scripture. That Holy Spirit will teach us and help us to know God's will for our lives. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You see, the Holy Spirit provides the power for us to accomplish God's will and commands for our lives. God doesn't leave us to fend for ourselves. He doesn't, he doesn't drive us somewhere and, and give, us these, give us these things and says, here, you've got an hour to do this and I'll, I'll see you in a little bit. I'll check back with you. No, he doesn't do that. What he does what is, is we follow him. He takes us and we do what he's calling us to do, but he gives us the power and he's with us through the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish the things that he's asking us to accomplish. Romans 8, 5 through 6 says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. The Holy Spirit leads us to the things of God. That's, that's what, what, when you're drawn to God, when you're drawn to Scripture, when you're drawn to the things of God, that's, that's not you but that's, that's the Holy Spirit drawing you, calling you towards the things of God. It's, it's pretty much like placing a, a bowl of chips and queso right here on one side and a bowl of broccoli here on the other, okay? I am, I am, I am immediately drawn to the, to the chips and queso. That's just, that it's in my blood to go there. Matter of fact, I don't, I don't even think my body thinks about it. It's just a natural response, just like your heart beats, you don't have to tell it to beat. Well, I mean, I just naturally go to the chips and queso. I'm not drawn over here to say, oh, look at these beautiful little trees. Don't, don't, they, don't they look delicious? Don't they look yummy? Man, I wish there was not only trees, but I wish there were some leaves in there too. No, I don't do that. I don't think about that because me by myself, guess what? I'm drawn to that. And here's the thing. By ourselves, we are always drawn to the things of this world. But it's the Holy Spirit that says, let me pull you, let me draw us to the things of God. 
It points us into the direction of God. It helps us to focus. This Holy Spirit helps us to focus on the things of God. And just like we said earlier, the Spirit gives us the power to choose the things of God. We, could, we can't ever have the excuse as followers of Christ, as obedient, as obedient disciples, we don't have the excuse to say, well, I had to choose that. I had to choose sin. That, that was my only option. If you hear yourself saying that, you need to knock yourself on the head and go, you're lying. Hello, wake up. Because it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power if we surrender to God, if we're obedient to Him, that gives us the power to choose the things of God. Followers of Jesus are characterized by being controlled by the Spirit. And after, after acting in obedience, and some of you may have heard this, and some of you may have even said this, but after acting in obedience to God, you may have heard people say, I, I don't know where that came from. Or I, I don't know how I was able to do that. Or I can't believe um, I said what I was able to say. Or, or we just, I can't believe we just saw what, what we just saw. You know what that is? That's... That's the Holy Spirit. It nudges us towards the things of God. That's, that's not you. Okay? That's not you. That's God in you. That's drawing you to the, to the things of God. The Holy Spirit draws us, and it's a great benefit to, to those who are obedient to him to follow Jesus. Romans 8, 28 says, Also, the Spirit helps us with our weakness. We don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself speaks to God for us, even begs God for us with deep feelings that words cannot explain. As long as we're here on this earth in these bodies, guess what? We have limitations. We're finite creatures. And Paul says here that we don't always even know what our real needs are as God sees them or what the needs are of others. And as one commentary puts it, we, we do not know the will of God respecting all of these things. But the great news about the Spirit is, is that it helps us. The Spirit goes before God on our behalf and communicates what we cannot. What an amazing benefit given to those who love God and choose to follow Him. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which draws us to God, which helps us to know God, and then speaks to God on our behalf. And lastly, a fourth benefit is a peace that overcomes I think when this world, when, when you talk about this world and culture, I think when this world thinks of peace, they assume that it means no conflict, uh, no trials, no suffering. And some, some, some Christians kind of preach that false message too, that loving God means there's no, no conflict, no trials, no suffering. But that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. The peace he's talking about here, as one commentary wrote, it's the calmness of confidence in God. How is peace possible in the midst of pain and struggle? Well, it's possible when our confidence is in God and not in anything else. One thing Jesus was sure of, and one thing that we can be sure of as his followers, is the love and approval of God. Circumstances do not change God's love. They do not change his approval of us. Because of Jesus, because of Jesus, God looks on us and he sees new creations. He sees us totally restored. Remember, Jesus is telling his disciples that he's leaving. If you read this chapter, and he's talking about him, he's leaving, and he's talking about going to the cross. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they're, they're somewhat confused, if not freaked out. And he tells them right there in verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. In, in John chapter 14, if you go back to verse 1, what does Jesus say there? He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus is saying this. You know why he's saying this? Because he knows their hearts are troubled. He knows that, that they're freaking out. I'm pretty sure Jesus saw the fear in their faces and he heard it in their voices. He's saying to them and he's saying to us, you can move forward in whatever is going on in your life. You can move forward in confidence because you belong to me. That is a great, great benefit of being a follower of Jesus. It's we belong to him. You may have peace. And it's not like the world's peace. Here's the difference. The world's peace is usually, usually based on self-reliance. And guess what? If I'm, if I'm relying on me, or you're relying on me, we're, we're both in trouble. 
John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. But take heart, and I don't know if it, um, it has it in, in, but in my version there it says, but take heart, and there's an exclamation point. But it's like, but take heart, but don't fear. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Hang in there. Why? Because I have overcome the world. Guess what? Peace doesn't mean the absence of trouble. Jesus told you that right there, but he says you can have peace in him because he's already won this war. He's overcome the world. As followers of Jesus, we can live and we should live in that truth. We have the victory. And like I share with the kids in the children's sermon, that should probably make us want to dance or do something, do flips, uh, hug our friends, or, or I don't know, jump. Because we live in victory. And I think as followers of Christ, we forget that benefit. We forget that we serve a victorious God. We forget that we've won the war. The battles are still to be fought, but we've won the war. We forget that we know how the story ends, that Jesus overcomes all. We forget that. And instead, what we focus on is we focus what we see on around us. We focus on what we see on CNN or or Fox News or MSNBC or or all the the other stuff that's out there. We focus on on the things that are right in front of us, and that's all we see. And and we, we we get so caught up in the negative, and we get so caught up, we can get so down. And I get it because I'm there with you. I, I live in this world with you, and I get that it's easily to be, it gets easy to be distracted. But one of the things that we can have as a follower of Jesus is we can have peace in the midst of all that. Why? Because we belong to the Father. We belong to the Father. Now, it doesn't take away the reality of our trials and our struggles and pains. Those are real, and I don't want to minimize that at all. In fact, you should know that your pain doesn't go unnoticed. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety... Cast all your cares, cast all your hurts, cast all your fears, cast all your struggles on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Here's something I want you to hear today. God is not indifferent to your sufferings. What Jesus says in John 14 and what he's saying here in in Peter is saying, here is our heavenly father and he is intimately concerned for his children. He's not unaware He's not oblivious and he's not apathetic. No, he calls for us to give them over to him. Why? Because he can, he can handle them and he wants to handle them. Why? Because he's, he's Lord of all. He's all powerful. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Why should we be strong and courageous? Why should we not be frightened or dismayed? Because we're strong enough to handle this. And. Eh. Because we've got what it takes. Wrong. Because we don't take nothing off nobody. That's not wrong too. Why should we be strong and courageous? Why should we have peace? Why should we not be frightened or dismayed? Because it said right there, because God is with us wherever we go. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Did you catch what David said? David says, even though I walk through. He didn't say, avoid, walk around, find a different way. No. He said, I know that in my life, I'm going to have to walk right in the middle of dark valleys. I know that I'm going to have to walk right in the middle of pain. But because of our obedience and because of David's obedience, he knew that God would give him exactly what he needed in that moment to do whatever God was asking of him and to face whatever storm was before him. What an awesome benefit of being a follower of Jesus. It's so overwhelming to me that as a follower of Jesus, he gives us assurance that we belong to him, that he reveals things to us that we would never know apart from him, that we have his power and presence in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And I don't have to be afraid because he gives me peace. Don't you want to be a follower of God? 